today I have with me uh, Najib Mohamad Noor. He is the CEO of Strand, a Malaysian company that's done wonderful things globally. Uh, and he is also the president of the Malaysian Aerospace Industry Association. So I would like to start off with maybe Najib, could you tell us a little bit about what Strand is currently doing and how it's evolved from where it originally was? Sure, thanks Ashok. Um, so Strand was originally an aircraft uh, design company, aircraft structural design company. So we would design uh, parts of the wings or the body, the fuselage and the landing gear or the engine of the aircraft. Um, so fundamentally it was very technical work, um, very detailed work and very data orientated work. So with those skills, uh, we developed two kind of um, uh, activities around what was the core. One was actual design capabilities, obviously. The other one was human capital development capabilities. Uh, and the reason being because we had um, a lot of graduate um, talent pool, um, which to be honest, once we tried to get them into doing the engineering work for effectively advisory uh, services for Western companies, i.e. we were telling the French, the Germans, or the uh, British, what to do. Um, there came a requirement for us to be able to develop Malaysians who can do that kind of uh, work. So we developed a lot of methodologies to develop people professionally, as well from a, from a, from a, a communication standpoint, from a um, collaboration standpoint, as well as a technical standpoint. So as we started doing that, um, we also found that uh, an initial niche was to support the development of more people like that, as a lot of Malaysian companies started wanting to go up the value chain, to go and design and build where such collaborations were necessary. Uh, although they could, they could maybe understand all the technical part of design, the collaborative part of design um, was a more challenging requirement. So we began training other people to develop engineers like ours, right? Um, now, as we evolved and we started working with a lot of companies, um, we also started working deeply with the technology companies associated with the aerospace uh, companies in Europe. So the aerospace companies would design the aircraft um, and then manufacture the aircraft. But then we also worked with the companies that design the software that design the aircraft. Uh, and those then put us into the realm of tech, real tech. Um, and I had many meetings with some of the best brains in the world in, in Europe on, on uh, software and technology development uh, and saw some pretty amazing stuff, you know, in terms of how they have been evolving technology, things like augmented reality, virtual reality, um, how they would use um, new um, algorithms to predict um, behaviors in data uh, from beta patterns that they were they were getting, you know. So, so what had started as an aerospace uh, discipline then evolved into uh, something which is much more broadly technological, but at a very high level. So with that kind of expertise then to advise on more strategic requirements of companies, companies now looking at not just going up the value chain, but evolving themselves to be, become broader in their capabilities to serve other high tech sectors. So today, Strand is known for more turnkey consulting, whether it be for the private sector or for the um, public sector, uh, where we have been involved with many roadmaps, uh, state level roadmaps, uh, national level roadmaps uh, development, uh, and uh, effectively going down the route of where many engineering services companies, so that's, that's our DNA, engineering services, right? Mm -hmm. um, many global engineering services companies today they have very, very deep technical um, roots for the same reason Strand does. So I would say people like Tata Consulting Services, uh, Tech Mahindra in India, uh, Atkins Global in the UK, um, uh, Altran, uh, Acker Consulting in France, right? Krakow Engineering in, in Germany. These are all deep, deep engineering services companies who now all have consulting functions because the fourth industrial revolution has forced many companies to not just consider um, pure organizational transformation from a point of view of management, but deeper than that, that the organization needs to now be technologically driven. So we are now entering into the space where traditionally your McKenzie's and your PwC's would be dominant. They are now engineering services companies with consulting functions 
which begin to enter into that space. And so in, in many ways, uh, we have competed with those traditional consulting companies and, some and sometimes we collaborate uh, with them. So it's been quite a journey. And, uh, and, and today, I think this is a capability that uh, we are now going towards you know, uh, designing platforms and services, digital services for. Excellent, Ajit. And I think even in the industry, you're known as the aerospace marketer, so to say. I mean, you're in the media, you speak on behalf of the industry. You're doing a lot of innovative stuff. Uh, which is going on globally and bringing it to Malaysia as well. Could you tell us maybe a little bit about what you're working on currently that uh, people would like to maybe share and learn from your experience? Okay, so uh, well, there's two two things that's happening. Um, as part of the of the Malaysian Aerospace Industry Association, uh, we have set out a recovery plan for the industry. Um, so there, um, I work strategically with uh, the CEOs of the larger aerospace companies in in Malaysia. Um, now, as an, as an ecosystem, we are 16.4 billion ringgit export per annum uh, just prior to COVID-19, right? So, and we were growing at one to one half billion a year uh, revenue per annum growth, right? So it was a growing industry. Um, now, COVID-19 obviously uh, has impacted the industry, but not in the way many, many understand. Many people think that the aircraft orders have been cancelled, but in fact, they haven't. There have been cancellations, but the backlog order of aircraft is actually about 40,000 aircraft, right? So there's seven years waiting list for a, a A320, for example, which is what AirAsia flies. Mm -hmm. So what's happened in this time is not people cancelling orders, but people deferring their deliveries. So you don't go to the shop to pick up your car. You just say, you hold my car until I can pay, mm -hmm. right? Or until I have a use for it. So that's where we are at. Um, now, this does result in an overall cash flow problem for companies because obviously it impacts revenue. It may not impact your order book or your valuation per se potentially, uh, but it does affect revenue. So um, in the West, we've had a lot of uh, uh, challenges with uh, some of the suppliers then not being able to sustain these things and they've been divesting either the company as a whole uh, uh, um, totally or the contracts. And um, so... In this dip where we have had uh, lower deliveries on programs that we already have, that means deferred deliveries. So instead of producing 10 aircraft parts, 10, aircra 10 parts of the same uh, in the same aircraft, this month I'll only produce five because only five are going to be delivered, right? So um, that other five capacity now, what they're doing is they're trying to fill it with new work. So the idea is then in the recovery, as travel resumes and uh, domestic travel in some countries like China uh, have, uh, have recovered quite tremendously, right? So more than 80% recovery already. Um, then we will have more parts of the aircraft for more volume as the industry recovers, right? So I've been working with the industry to plan this uh, and in partnership with the government. Uh, hence, we got involved with uh, you know, uh, inputs for the RMK12 budgets, which have been announced. And there's a very strong aerospace influence. So a lot of educating and the strategy development with the government and industry to uh, facilitate what will be hopefully an exponential recovery. So that's one part of the, of the work that uh, we've been doing. And then um, on the uh, human capital side of things, um, we have been looking at building ecosystems uh, for, for like the state government of Selangor. We've, worked, we've done some work there to build ecosystems for technology, um, industries, uh, starting with aerospace, that will hire and create the need for um, human capital, which now need to be facilitated the, facilitated the development of in context of the fourth industrial revolution. So in there, we've been uh, providing inputs to institutions. Um, so content, um, I have myself delivered um, actual um, lectures. So I, I'm actually a lecturer in the Selangor Business School for the MBA. Uh, where I, I teach a model on entrepreneurship. So actual content delivery, um, as well as content development um, for from management to technology uh, for institutions towards powering industrial ecosystem growth. So quite a broad sort of scope of very detailed bits of work uh, that we get, we get involved with. Mm -hmm. So fantastic. So with, with students today who are actually studying aerospace engineering or engineering itself, uh, what can they actually plan towards or, or, you know, look forward to with the current pandemic going on? And as you see, the delivery, the delivery is slower. 
what should they are uh, institutions like yourself pivoting what they're actually being taught well i think um so what they're being taught in school uh, there's there's the base technical stuff right so the base technical stuff is like maths right those things don't change yeah so um it's it's how they applied um and the different business models that are evolving now which are changing okay so um i think in as far as fundamental learning for most of the technical disciplines uh those are untouched at least until probably the undergraduate level yeah um that's not to say that you need to go to university to get become a tech technology uh leader anymore right i think as uh, elon musk and many others have proven right you don't have to complete that 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 formal tertiary education right uh, because most of the uh, mathematical and scientific fundamentals to engineer products is actually already in the um you know the form 5 syllabus i would say you know or the a level syllabus right uh, so um they go what to school hot <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I mean, the, at the end of the day, the university experience has to evolve. Um, it's not defunct from the point of view of an environment, but it may be defunct in 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 the in as far as content or content delivery is concerned. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think the power to self learn now is um, has has increased tremendously with technology, right? So there are many ways you can learn um, something now. Right. If you wanna you wanna learn one on one economics, I don't I don't have to rely on just the lecturer that's put in front of me at the university. Right. I've got probably a thousand different lecturers on YouTube that can teach me the same subject in a thousand different ways. Right. Mm -hmm. So I have choices in terms of self learning on 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 certain content. But the university's function also allows collaboration in a physical environment, mm -hmm. and that's where a lot of other learning also happens with peers. Right uh, now, granted, you can also do that virtually today, but I think universities as centers of learning and centers of knowledge now become more important rather than centers of certification. Right, uh, so I think the certification function of universities will begin to diminish. That means the university degree, uh, in my opinion, becomes less and less important, and I think that's quite you know openly said right now by most uh, large companies which have to, which are either dealing in tech or. Uh, or having to work using tech, right? Yeah. Um, but the ability to learn is still something that universities facilitate, and I think that function still continues, right? In in many different uh, ways, right? And yeah. as as an aggregator of knowledge as well, a center for people to come together to develop knowledge. I think universities are still an important uh, thing there, right? Uh, unfortunately, obviously in Malaysia, university plays more of the certification function. And hence, why uh, we have to evolve our education system, right? And and that's what the Ministry of Higher Education and uh, Education is looking at. Mm -hmm. And and do you find that um, currently, when the the graduates come out, they are job ready? I I know you've commented before that um, you find that there's a gap, but is the gap getting smaller? Well, I think the gap is relative, right? So the gap is a function of the job. Um, what we have a, a challenge with in Malaysia is the um, particularly for engineering, um, the availability of challenging technology jobs, right? So they, they aren't the jobs, <laughs> right? So, you know, you ideally, if you're an aerospace engineer, you want to graduate the next door, next across from your, your house is Boeing or NASA, right? And then your first job is there. <laughs> so um, in Malaysia, at least we have some companies like that, right? In the, in the aerospace environment, but um, in most, most cases for manufacturing, the, the the, the company across the road is a low cost manufacturing company mm -hmm. right so where the business model is on labor cost arbitrage right mm -hmm. so company like that uh, has got a very clear uh, um, mandate which is to produce cheap using labor mm -hmm. right so that could be anything from electronics goods to uh, medical equipment rubber gloves or whatever right mm -hmm. so once if a, a person going into that environment from where you know you've come from and an expectation of knowledge mm -hmm. and then gone into an operational environment which is has a very narrow um outcome yeah which is this bottom line margin mm -hmm. right uh, based on this labor cost arbitrage and a process that you've adopted from somewhere that's developed in japan or whatever right um, then it narrows you as a person Quite tremendously you know so 
So I think um, when we look at uh, the job market and the gap, uh, I think the gap more often than not is in expectations, right? Of the job, right? Because <laughs> the, the high end job's not there. Uh, dealing with a lot of HR in Malaysia. So what you can find today, there's a lot of gap between HR and the CEO. So in Malaysia now, the CEOs are challenged with creating value because this whole labor cost arbitrage type of thing or you know cheaper electricity or whatever it is, tax incentives, or whatever it is, those, those things don't work anymore mm -hmm. because there are people who are cheaper um, or uh, people with better tax incentives, right? Um, so what happens is that um, the, uh, the, the, the mothership, you know, in the US, whatever now says, you know, you have to add more value. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. We should move to Vietnam or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly, the, the sea level is now tasked with transforming the business. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find we're dealing a lot of sea level. This is, uh, this, is, this is out of the norm. This is the new norm. Yeah. Let's put it that way. The new norm requirement, right? Uh, so they painted in all sorts of guises, industry 4.0, yada, yada, but all about creating more value when before the requirement was simply to operate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at the HR, then HR was there to make sure there are people on the floor. Mm -hmm. Now, suddenly HR is saying, uh, CEO is telling HR, you need to create me the future workforce. <laughs> And it's never been in the in the job description, neither the organizational description, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this very big gap between the C level and the HR. Uh, and I've actually spoken in some seminars uh, specifically for HR people, um, where CEOs are telling the HR people, "This is the problem," and at the moment, a lot of you are irrelevant <laughs> to what we have to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you put the student in that context. Mm -hmm. Where do they sit, right? None of this is visible to them. None of this is visible to them. So now they're trying to plan a career for an organization that may not survive, mm -hmm. right? But their parents are saying, you got to work because it's the right brand, right? It's multinational. Yeah. Yeah. So you find a lot of youngsters now turning towards entrepreneurship, which is great. But without, for, for technology and engineering businesses, without a very healthy environment of technology creation around you, i.e. having NASA and Boeing across the road and so on and so forth, you as an entrepreneur, your learning is going to be very slow, right? You're trying to do this in Malaysia where the products are being uh, developed in the US, yeah? Mm -hmm. So hopefully with technology being what it is, it connects the world better so that you can have that same experience, like strands engineers. So strands engineers learn to become European space, aerospace engineers. So when we send them over there, it's quite interesting because a lot of them, uh, they get sent maybe after the fourth year of working with us um, over there when we do work like that. And they're always apprehensive, right? They go, like, oh, we're going to go there, you know, okay, on the phone and all that, it's fine, you know, I'm quite comfortable, but I'm going to go there, right? Oh, it's going to be the real thing, the real thing. And uh, within like, a week of being there, they realize that, oh, it's as if I've always been here, <laughs> right? So we try to create that environment of learning so that they are world-class global players. And I think more companies in Malaysia uh, will have to facilitate that and the government have to facilitate that if we're going to move to the next, uh, the next level of industrial development. So that's fantastic to know that we actually have Malaysian companies that can hold their own internationally. So from what I hear, you know, we've got the industry which is actually finding its footing now a bit and it's pivoting quite a bit. The students are also trying to, you know, be more job ready and, you know, uh, to actually fit the role that they are going to need to fit in. Is the government playing a role to actually help this process happen or, uh, you know, they're still trying to figure things out? Absolutely. I think the government, um, no, no, no shortage of plans that have been announced, right? In the last even two years, right? If you think about it that way. Um, so we've got the Wawasan Kemakmuran Bersama, which has a very strong, um, not just uh, social, but uh, a technological basis uh, to it. So it appreciates the, the need for our economy to evolve. Um, that is also because our economic complexity is also low, right? Economic complexity, meaning that um, if you think about it like Lego bricks, right? So um, if you only have the, you know, the, the three, three dot Lego brick square, right? And you have a lot of them. You can make a lot of stuff, but you can, you know, not as many different things as if you had, you know, the same pile of, let's say a thousand Lego bricks, but broken up into the triangular ones and the 
conical ones and you know then you can make more complex component uh complex things right so that's economic complexity so we're like this four lego you know three three lego brick type of country we have only certain things that we can make because we don't have all of those capabilities and the issue is that as as economies become more complex that means you have to output more diverse products that are now servicing different business models not just consumer business models but service business models right so instead of a product to buy to sell um, to buy for someone to buy you sell the service of that product right which means it's a completely different product because you don't nobody owns it it's part of a maybe even a, a, a cyclic economy right so when you have those kind of uh, those kind of requirements now um, uh, in industry it becomes quite 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 challenging for uh, I think the local companies to try and keep up right and therefore the government is up to this point being very dependent on the input from the industry right mm -hmm. so in some ways practically speaking it's blind leading the blind practically speaking right uh, in terms of intention not not the case right so the government relies then on foreign consultants a lot for these kind of insights you know so is the government trying to help yes they are have they put the plans in yes they have um, but the devil is in the execution the detail of the execution and the detail of the execution at the moment is this ground level uh, low level of complexity and maturity that you're trying to build a complex economy from as opposed to say the south koreans or the japanese right after the second world war um, South Korea probably a better example because they were very much like Malaysia after the Second World War. Um, they did not have commodities, right? They didn't have oil, they didn't have all these things, right? So they had to rely on this commodity, just like Singapore, right? To rely on this commodity. And um, uh, I think from there, they built technology companies, you know? So a company that was making maybe sewing machines today is Hyundai, you know? Uh, you know? So, so these companies evolved into technology companies and therefore they have these big technology bases. Whereas Malaysia, right after the Second World War, um, I think um, we were you know, a British colony. And if you see most of the initial companies that came in, I mean, they were all British companies, right? It's almost like a second wave of colonization. If you can think about it that way. Um, but we were quite happy because it was a very, very, um, very amicable split, if you like, right? We went there with all the pomp and circumstance, signed some, some piece, pieces of paper and we were free, right? Um, and in there, however, we also then absorbed these companies and, uh, and we then began working for them. And this whole mentality of working for the MNC became ingrained, right? It became ingrained in our, our psyche. You know, you and I, when we went to school, that was it, right? You, you went to school, if you, had, if you did well, you maybe could work for MNC and go go places, right? That was the ambition. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know. Uh, so it was only the uh, the screw ups like us who had to <laughs> couldn't get into the MNC and had to build our own businesses, right? Um, and learn how to build. So we learned how to build, and there, there are only some people who learn how to build, and the rest learn how to work. Mm -hmm. So the ones who have learned how to work now, the government is trying to turn into builders. Mm -hmm. You see the so so are they doing something? Yes, but it is a it is an uphill struggle, right? It's an uphill battle. So like like when companies like yours, you know, you see all this disruption happening, and while you're figuring out your own business model to move forward, but you're also going in and actually helping these companies, you know, um, re-strategize and plan ahead and and actually help them execute because, you know, every the devil's in the details, right? Have you ever found that there are actually some companies or, or maybe a specific niche in the industry that's already figured it out and they're already leaping ahead and there are certain, certain best practices that others could learn from? Yes, yes. Um, most of these organizations, um, they resonate with their leaders, right? So uh, I think it's very spiritual in that sense because because uh, a lot of their leaders may may or may not have had the pri the privilege or the opportunity to experience firsthand, right? Um, the more advanced environment, like I did, right? I, I was in the UK for ten years and I was there, you know, trained within the Airbus ecosystem. So I was built from there. Some uh, from here, you know, have reached out and and learned about these new environments by really reaching out, right? So at the end of the day, these leaders, right? So myself coming back, I bring an energy 
that I've absorbed from different country and I bring it to the country here and then the people that I work with resonate with that or some of these guys who have managed to build themselves up become global then there are people then resonate with their abilities right so these kind of companies are differentiated these kinds of companies are differentiated um, in the technology space it's a much harder thing to go from Malaysia out because there's so many things to learn so if you're not learning every day in an environment then it's difficult for you to get all the skills that you need right but I found that uh, in, in more narrow environments or where you know where the tech is more online right uh, Malaysians have been able to do that I mean grab obviously is a, is a fantastic example of that right so these guys learned it online and uh, they, they learn how to become a world player online but it is a social network and there's a lot of uh, uh, um, copying you know of business models right and then testing in, in local environments so I would say it is uh, it, the country is ripe for that kind of movement um, but the number of entrepreneurs who first have that kind of clear motivation needs to increase yeah because most people are still looking just to find a job um, and then number two is that for the deep tech entrepreneurs those who are dealing with deep technology like aerospace or you know high-end medical devices or something like that um, there is some bridging that needs to be done in some creative way you know maybe bringing foreign smes um, into the country rather than the mncs um, to help incubate uh, local companies uh, to become global companies and I, and I understand you yourself, um, you advising companies who, who are actually looking to grow and find their way. What typically would you do for a company like that? How, what would your consulting method be? Okay, so um, I'm an engineer um, at heart, right? So my methods and my company's methods and the methods of my guys, well, all of which are engineers, so we don't have a, anybody that started as an MBA. We have one or two that have gained MBAs along the way. Uh, but they're all engineers, right? So like with any engineer, we, we structure the problem, right? So we look at, well, where are we starting from? Uh, so assessments and gap analysis, both technical and, um, and professional, uh, we do those assessments. And then we look at market entry positions, right? So we say, okay, right, um, you know, based on where you are, I'm looking at some technology markets here, right? You can probably enter here. But this is the bridge that you need to go through or you can go somewhere higher but you need to make a much bigger investment right or you have to seek for some really you know really effective partnership and then i'll tell you whether or not hey, can you do it or not right frankly you know do you have the mindset the knowledge the uh the uh, finances to do it right so i would be very much the advisor uh, my guys would be the advisor to the company heads um as a second in terms of like a second management to them um, and we would normally do long-term engagements. So our engagements tend to go for, I think the longest ones we have, which keep going off and on, off and on, maybe a three, four years already, you know? So, um, and some of the engagements can be as long as a, a year and a half, um, just on one contract, you know? A one and a half year consulting contract, right? Of transforming. So you can imagine there's a lot of relationships that's built um, and it's engineering and building ground up. Uh, but also because Strand works with government, we have the ability to also give you a, vis a visibility from top down. By working on national plans or state level plans and so on and so forth, we can see where the top down strategy is coming from and we can try and put you in the bottom up. So we found that we have a quite a, a strong niche here to support companies. And because we're an aerospace company also, we are also very good at managing data. I mean, people's data. So we can manage because we, we, we used to design aircraft from Boeing and aircraft and from Airbus in the same room, right? But the data is aggregated and the IP is protected, right? And that's just the integrity of an aerospace engineer. You know, you managing that's just part of your business. So managing discre discreetly data that is government and private sector, those are things which, uh, I mean, very, very in developed countries, it's a norm. Right. Most, most of the consultant companies can do that. But I think here, um, I think we have a special niche in being able to do that for, for very high tech things and very, very critical or strategic programs of the government. And, and you know, sometimes a, a leader of a company, he's, he's not sure when to hit the panic button and when to actually look for outside help. What are typically the triggers that you would say, you know, a CEO or, 
or board should look out for that when they see these signals, it's time to get outside help before you know all things go belly up. And the problem that we find, first of all, with a lot of Malaysian companies is that um, there is a reluctance to change. It's not in the DNA, right? The DNA is to find something solid and just sit on it for ever, <laughs> right? That's the, that's the DNA of a company uh, in Malaysia. So as opposed to, let's say, let's put it this way. Um, in Germany, right, if you look at the Mittelstand, uh, which is the, the mid-level companies, right, which make up the bulk, 75% of German industry is the Mittelstand, most of which are uh, family-run, uh, family-owned companies as well, right? So Siemens, for example, is a collection of a lot of Mittelstand companies, right? And uh, there's like almost like a, an aggregator role that Siemens, a corporation, plays of all of these capabilities. But you see technology development all happen at the ground level with these companies, okay? Why? Because... Today, they may be doing parts of an aircraft cockpit, right? In terms of the avionics or something like that. But the great-grandfather might have been a watchmaker, right? Or an agricultural machine equipment maker, you know, a hole maker or something like that. But they would have evolved. They would have learned from these technologies, base technologies, they would have grown, they would have built on. So from agriculture, uh, equipment maker to watchmaker, which is maybe more technical, and then from watchmaker to clock maker, which is slightly bigger, then to machine maker, right, for maybe the food industry, and then for finally aerospace. Mm -hmm. So there is a lineage of knowledge that's accumulated over generations. In Malaysia, no, you know, we want to just get, okay, here we go, a nice concession here. We can do this for the rest of our life. Uh, always can make money. We're happy. The weather is good. Uh, let's just do this until we can't do it anymore, <laughs> right? So, so the trigger, which is your question, with a lot of nation companies is only when they go, they see the cliff. And that's a problem. Because by the time you see the cliff, actually, you need to understand what that cliff is. And most of them don't understand that cliff. They just see a cliff. People just stop buying, right? Or people just want to pay so much less that you can't continue, your margins are short. And then you look across, oh, Vietnam is now offering something that actually can beat that and still maintain the, their cost, you know? So I'm stuck. Then they press the panic button. But that panic button is a panic button, just get me out of here. Not panic button saying, transform me, right? Not panic button, let me evolve. Because when you come with those more complex things, and I've seen in certain circumstances, they say, oh, we want to reinvent ourselves, you know, and they'll call a consultant in. You know, I've actually seen this once with a very large company, in fact, a utilities company, right? Um, and uh, they said, you know, we want to transform. So we see the French company here, Veolia, for example. Veolia is an environmental management company. You know, it promises you a better life, right? <laughs> That's what it is, right? Through water management, through uh, sewerage management, and so on and so forth. But there's this whole outcome facilitated by technology. So they say, oh, I want to be like that, right? Um, but I think once, you know, the consultant has gone through and said, okay, here's your DNA, this is how your DNA needs to change, da, 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 da. and then the management just said, actually, can't we just have another logo that kind of looks as good as theirs? <laughs> so, <laughs> so they, you know, it comes simplified to, this like, don't we just have to repackage ourselves and people will still buy the same crap from us? <laughs> you know what I mean? So this, this is where... Um, organizational maturity generally, particularly in very large organizations in Malaysia, is, is usually a problem because they're not born to innovate, they're born to offtake. Mm -hmm. They're born to offtake from something or someone, right? Whether it's the uh, agriculture industry or the oil and gas industry they're offtaking from, or in the 80s, the electronics industry that came in here set up these big plants. A lot of our Malaysians, so remember when we were young and we would go to school and we'd pass by PJ, you see the lines of Malaysians waiting to get into the Kilang, the Mat Emina Kilang, movies were made of them, right? That was, that was a, a grease for us. <laughs> so uh, today, those queues are not Malaysians. What does that tell you, you know? That means the factory is still the same, but you can't afford to employ Malaysians anymore. So nothing has changed. Right? It's the same factory, except 80%, 70%, 60% of the workforce is Bangladeshi or Myanmar or something, something like that, which tells you that factory should be in Bangladesh or Myanmar or wherever it is, right? Not here. Right? So you see this, and this is in like, even in PJ, I think there was, there's still a lot of that kind of thing going on, right? So, so I think that's where 
we have uh, we have a serious problem when it comes to leadership um, in co corporate leadership. Um, and when you say panic button, like I say, most of the time they press it. I would say ninety percent of them press it to say get out of here, get me out of here. And I think most of them through this crisis will potentially just say, I'm just going to cash out. My kids have got enough money. I've done my job. I can retire into the sunset. Not my problem. Mm -hmm. And everyone else in the company goes down, the economy goes down further. Yes. Yes. And that's, that's, the, that's the very, that's the slope that we are well down now. It's happening. I think COVID-19, in a way, uh, a lot of this statistics, data and all that, um, whatever is happening now, right? If you look at, you know, where M40 is becoming B40, right? We have all these kind of issues. Um, this was already inside the 4.0 warning signs on the government did before COVID. But the, the horizon was five to 10 years. So all COVID-19 did was bring it forward to now, <laughs> right? It disrupted so many things in ways that technology was supposed to disrupt, like supply chains. Technology was supposed to disrupt supply chains, right? Oh, I do 3D printing now, so I don't have to do a whole supply chain of parts manufacturers. I just send the data and then people with 3D printer across the world can print out the product. Disrupt the whole supply chain. But COVID-19 has gone, well, you know what? Let's just stop the ships from <laughs> going, right? Oh no, <laughs> can't send the part physically there. How do we do this, right? So it evolves. I mean, like, like, like you know, Zoom, yeah? So physically stopping certain things has now accelerated technology adoption to the point where once certain thresholds of efficiencies have been achieved, there's no going back. And whichever countries cannot keep up with that now become at risk if their economies are dependent on those, on those, uh, those kind of economies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so Malaysia, to be honest, is operating way below where we should be based on the potential of our, our people and the fact that we have one of, I think the, I think we're something like the third most um, educated country in the world, right? As far as amount of spending per capita, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, but with all that, we have unemployable graduates. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you mentioned you Vietnam know? earlier, and I'm sure like yeah. Singapore and the other countries that, that have their own competitive advantage um, where do we stand, you know, in, in this context? I mean, like you mentioned, we've got a good workforce, um, but obviously price may be a factor. We're not as cost effective as, as the other countries. Uh, what's our advantage, actually? And what are you actually doing to help this space grow? I think what is our advantage is in this call, you know, you and I are equally Malaysian. But heritage-wise, your Indian descent, I'm Malay descent. In fact, I'm not Malay descent. I'm partly Gujarati, I'm partly Indonesian, I'm partly Chinese, and I'm probably, you know, 5% uh, is actually indigenous blood, right? So, um, so in, in essence, Malaysia's real um, strength is that it is already a center of collaboration, both culturally and, uh, and business-wise, right? Not yet technologically, but business-wise, we are a center of collaboration, right? Um, and if you look at Malaysia's political role um, in the region, it has it has somehow been able to play an arbitrator role in many uh, conflicts, right? Why? Because we are those people who make everybody feel comfortable, right? And in some cases, uh, a lot of that also comes to the character of what is the Malay. When, when you define what a Malay is, it's very difficult. Like I say, I'm Malay, but genetically, <laughs> I'm probably more Indian than I am Malay, right? But my culture practice and my, my mindset is that. And so Malay, Malay tends to be a very inclusive term. It is anthropologically a very inclusive term, right? And that's how Malaysia has become. So you find Malays also, generally, if we speak uh, Malay speaking with other races, the mimicry is always the Malay will mimic the other races uh, accent, right? Uh, which can be very annoying when you put a, a Malaysian in France, right? <laughs> or in the UK. <laughs> but it means that the first thing that they do is fit in so that people can come together and collaborate because that's, that's the natural state of Malaysia is to collaborate. So um, very different from say mainland India and mainland China, 
where competition is very stiff, Southeast Asia actually is much more, because um, it's less densely populated, it is much more ready for collaboration, right? Um, but if you look at Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, you know, war torn, right? These countries are war torn, right? Malaysia didn't have that, right? We have wars, but it was like 1511 and <laughs> I think the last one, the Second World War, okay. <laughs> That's what it was. And it was like a war that came to us, you know what I mean? So um, when we look at when we look at these kind of histories, um, you know, Vietnam with its communist background um, is highly organized, highly organized, um, predominantly single race, right? And with that kind of coordination and that kind of drive, Plus, also, they are, um, their demographic is globally dispersed. You go to NASA, right? I can guarantee you 10% of NASA is Vietnamese, <laughs> right? Because I know 10% of Airbus is probably Vietnamese, right? And Thai and Cambodian, you know? So they have a diaspora who've achieved very high levels of competency. If at any point to return, like in Bangalore, in India, you have an instant technology hub. So what's our strength? Our strength is collaboration. What's our threat is that other people can organize faster than we can on very pressing matters. They're, hung, they're hungry for it, right? Now, where maybe the saving grace is this, the fourth industrial revolution actually as, as economies evolve, it evolves towards the sustainability development goals, right? So like it or not, the environment has said, Okay, I've had enough of you, you know, crapping in my seas and <laughs> killing my animals. So here you go. I'm going to send you the smallest little thing, a virus, and I'm going to get you all to stop doing what you're doing, right? And if you think about it philosophically like that, that's what Mother Nature has done to us now. Mm -hmm. And in that kind of environment now, we really have to look inwards. And the SDGs become much more prominent now. We have to look at social requirements first. Yeah, you can be technologically advanced, but if three quarters of your population is poor and hungry, you can't sustain yourself as a government anymore, right? Right. Uh, so with these kind of pressures which are pushing towards social and environmental and, you know, more, how shall I say, humanistic um, values, right? Away from mass production, mass consumption values, Malaysia may just have that niche of a value proposition to guide Southeast Asia's thought process and become an aggregator of that, right? But we will need to master technology for us to function like that. We will need, we will need technology for us to function like that. And we will have to understand things like the environment. So things like forests, we're cutting it down now, you know, at a higher rate, you know, uh, that day people were very sad about the durian thing, but at the same time, you should be sad also the fact that they cut down basically forest reserve. And we have one of the 11 most biodiverse forests forest areas in the world. And if you look at what the fourth industrial revolution is, it's about data, right? So when you look at data, right? Data is in things, right? So in the forest, the biodiversity is a treasure trove of bio data. Mm -hmm. So if we were to value that in context of technology, right? So you see the new technologies uh, coming up will be biotechnologies, right? CRISPR gene editing, um, uh, epigenetic uh, medicine, you know, all of these things, they are, they, what they need is biodiversity to understand what are the possible bio, biological outcomes. So you need to study that. And the forest is effectively a massive library of that. So if you were to value that, it's more valuable than oil, more valuable than anything else, but we're cutting it down. So the new value of Malaysia will be things that today we must learn very quickly to appreciate so that we don't lose out in what is the coming economy when oil doesn't matter because we're getting our, our electricity from the sun, right? From solar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what matters is going to be knowledge and who's got the knowledge, whoever's got the repository of it, the natural repository of it. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think that at this moment with all this change that SMEs, the small guys have a chance to get in and, and actually capitalize on some of the opportunities now? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think well, there's a transitionary opportunity simply to be a little bit more technologically advanced now, right? Mm -hmm. So the region will have to evolve. We are already ahead of the game, yeah? So the idea is that if we can make that step change in the first instance, we can provide the interim solution 
for 4.0 production for the region, for example, right? Uh, but longer term, then we have to evolve that into the economy to allow us to do that, right? To get into the interim state, we have to get into the interim state, and we have to divest ourselves from the old business models and embrace the new business models. Yeah. But then very quickly from there, we have to also understand that it'll evolve very rapidly into what is a knowledge economy. So there are two steps to what we have to do. Um, and I think, I think this, uh, this, uh, this crisis is forcing us to look very sharply at that and very seriously at that because um, we are dwindling in resources. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you're under that kind of pressure will you, you know, start to think your way out of it, right? And, and so now you've, you've not only, you not only advise the aerospace industry, but you can also advise uh, companies that are in the industry 4.0. I want to get into industry 4.0 and aerospace being in transportation. Um, I guess you can also advise transportation companies and those that are in manufacturing that want to also catapult ahead. Is there anything that you want to add as your final words before we end this session? No, I think uh, it's been a good session. Um... I think as a final word is that uh, we we have to be watching uh, day to day now uh, things which are which are trans uh, um, people are people are getting caught up with a lot of the politics at the moment right um, and uh, and I think unhealthily not because you know whatever it is that's happening in politics but um, politics is also being used as a scapegoat for the guy on the street right I have a hard time. My life is bad because of politics, right? Um, I mean, these are the same people for, for a very long time. Ah, I don't care what the politicians do, you know? I don't believe in politics. Why? Because there's still oil in the ground and the politicians keep pumping the oil money into the economy. You know, stuff is still cheap. Uh, you can still go to Starbucks and uh, no problem, right? You're living a good life. Yeah, of course, I don't care about politics. But now, as these pressures become real, you know, white flag and so on and so forth. I was just distributing some food yesterday for white flag, you know, and you just understand what these guys are going through and not work for months already. You know why? Because that thing that was sponsored by all of these commodities is disappeared, right? So now as this reality starts coming down, they say, oh, it's the politicians. It's the politics that's done it. But that's not the case. It is not the politics that has done it. It has evolved now to the point where you now have to look inwards and say, actually, it's me. I am now not relevant anymore to what is the future economy that I have to now serve. I'm still trying to do the whole thing, right? And I'm blaming the, politi the politician for it. Okay. That's, that's, that's good. That's good advice, actually. So basically take the bull by the horns, do what you can, and get your, yourself out of distress. So thanks, Najib. Thank you so much for that insightful session. Um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from listening to that. I hope all the uh, listeners do as well. And you can contact Najib with his email address that we've attached here and uh, get in touch with Strand and check them out on LinkedIn. You know, uh, Najib posts a lot of uh, industry news on his LinkedIn channel as well, which is Najib Mohamad No. Thank you and catch you for our next session. Ciao. Thanks. <laughs>